activity that will be led by Krista, my sister here. Um, and then after we do that, we will hear from Natalia and Peter. And then at the end, there will be some time for some discussion and questions and synthesis. Um, so here we go. Good afternoon, everyone. So what I'm going to ask is for you all to find groups of four. And so to turn your chair, um, turn your body, and find a little group of four. And today we're going to be talking a lot about climate emotions, both of our presenters in different ways. And so to start out, connect with your group around a couple of questions, if you can. And those questions are, what are the moments that prompt your climate emotions to arise? And what does that look like? How does it show up? And what do you do about it? So those are our three questions. And now's the time to turn to your group.
this is your one minute warning to wrap up your conversations in your group. Okay, beautiful groups, if you can finish your thought and turn back towards the collective. from any group wants to come to the front, maybe is the easiest way to do it, and share briefly um, anything that they learned, any commonalities, anything that surprised you, anything that felt comforting. Um, do we have any volunteers? Anything that anyone found comforting? No comfort was found. <laughs> Putting bourbon in one's hot chocolate. Putting bourbon in one's hot chocolate is, sounds like a good coping. Yeah. Um, I shared that a, a friend the other day was telling me he's really comforted sometimes by the idea of deep time and imagining what a blip we are compared to 10,000 years or a million years from now. Um, he found that very comforting. I find it kind of uh, <laughs> discomforting or, or makes me feel a little, I can't even think of the word anymore, but a little helpless or, or insignificant. Uh, so it can go both ways, I think, but deep time was one thing that came up for us. Thank you so much for that. I'm also a big fan of deep time. Anything that anyone found surprising or new? Well, I don't know if this is exactly uh, new or surprising, but um, uh, one insight that we kind of unraveled was that um, our we don't really have uh, climate emotions per se, because the emotion, the emotionality or the affect permeates our entire kind of existence. Um, and in the same way that the environment surrounds and holds us, the emotions in regards to it kind of set up our um, inter individual interactions with other people. So it's um, very much um, uh, kind of in the, um, yeah, just kind of like seep has seeped through our consciousness and is affecting everything. Um, what? Imbricated? Yeah, you could say imbricated. <laughs> so, another good word. Okay, but yeah. That's 
That's a lovely perspective. Thank you. Anything? Um, hmm. Yeah. A any other insights? Jo I'm not going to give you a category. Any other? Yeah. Come on up. Hello. Uh, there are a minimum of three parents in our group of four, and 60% of the parents said that they had felt anxiety about, um, you know, being parents in, in this time and trying to find ways to explain things to their kids. So there was a little trend. Um, one climate emotion that I experience while I watch you all talk is just hope to see how engaged everyone is with one another together on this topic. Um, so a final invitation, is there anything else that you all talked about in your groups that you want to share with a broader group? Yep. Hey, um, I guess I didn't talk about this so much in the group, but just thinking about it a little more in a way that's kind of comforting is just thinking about the scales of actions we can take and the scales of the problem. So we're here thinking about climate, which is a big sort of wicked global, big scary monster kind of problem. But thinking about our role and the, the scales of actions we can take are much more local, whether it be direct action or whether it be through, you know, existing channels of contacting representatives and politicians that influence climate, um, just trying to break down the tasks of action into smaller pieces that are locally relevant. Um, even thinking about like the construction of the Mountain Valley pipeline in the region here, um, you know, who are the people that are actually acting in those scales that feel relevant to us as an individual can be comforting and motivating, hopefully. Beautiful. Thank you so much. So I'm just going to um, leave you all with a couple um, more sort of frames around emotion in general, and then one really brief little exercise at the end. Um, so in my work as a therapist, I work with people's emotions a lot. And one frame that seems to be helpful is what does it even mean when people say processing your feelings or feeling your feelings? It's like, what does that even mean? Um, and one of the things that that means is taking it in in the right amount. So if I think about water, I can drink water and I can also sort of drown in the water. Um, and that doesn't really help me um, get nourished in the way that I need. So how do I regulate my emotions so I'm just taking them in in the right amount where I can sort of feel them moving through me instead of totally overwhelming me or drowning me? And there's lots of different ways to do that. Um, and one of them is to be, take it in with other people, right? We have more ability to process these things and move and regulate them with other people. So a skill in working with any kind of emotion, but especially climate emotion, is helping you be able to regulate a little bit. And what that means is also being able to put something down when it's getting overwhelming or when I need to like, you know, uh, go to work and do my emails. Um, what we don't want to do is suppress because that sort of um, doesn't make things go away. We feel it tapping on our shoulder. We feel it growing and building in pressure. Um, but we can sort of just put things aside, knowing that they're in a safe place and reassuring like ourselves and the feeling, I'm going to come back to you when I have the resources to do that. And so in trauma therapy, there's like this idea, and some of you all might be familiar with this, that you kind of have a safe place where you put these feelings 
that doesn't look like suppressing or pushing away or saying, I don't have time for you, but saying, I'm going to put you in this safe place um, where you'll be protected, understood, cared for, and then when I have the resources, I can come back to that. So I want us to just pause for a second, and this might feel a little woo-woo, but you know, strangers change. So um, <laughs> let's try this on for a second. <laughs> um, what would be that safe place for you? Is it an imaginary place? So just as I'm talking, maybe just you can be listening. You can also be thinking. Is that an imaginary place? for you? Is that a place that you've been that feels really safe and nurturing? Is that a place that you know exists but you've never been that feels really safe and nurturing? Some people like to put it in an actual box, right? Is there an object, a box, a closet, um, a room? that feels like a safe place to just let these feelings rest temporarily. And some people like to think of it as a person. Is there somebody who I know who has the capacity or the wisdom or the, just the understanding of these feelings that I know could hold them for me and that they'd be safe and taken care of? And I'm wondering too about this space, like how many of you would be willing to, and I mean this in a metaphorical way, hold some of this for the other people in your group. So could it even be a feeling that you got in the group of being understood or being able to share? Some place like this kind of meeting, some person who really understood you today, who could hold some of this for you. So just take a couple more seconds to think about where would these feelings go to rest, knowing that they'll be taken care of and that I'll come back for them when I'm ready. Okay, thank you. All right, so we are gonna move on to our main event. Um, our first presenter is going to be the amazing Peter Kalmus, um, whose passionate work in climate science and activism I find incredibly inspiring, and who I've had the pleasure of getting to know a little over the past several months. Um, as you'll see here in a moment, Peter's dedication to the climate movement is based upon his deep knowledge and expertise. He sees the data and is calling upon all of us to turn that information into action. Um, if you're interested in regular glimpses into Peter's view of the front lines of climate action, you might join his large social media following. He tweets and grams at Climate Human. Um, and... Um, you may also feel during his presentation that climate emotions might arise. Um, and um, we will have space for, dis for discussion um, after the presentations and Natalia. Then we'll be also offering some uh, particular technique for processing some feelings and we have our safe place to put our feelings. Um, but um, it's all, it's, it's such important stuff. So Peter is a data scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory um, and an associate project scientist at UCLA's Joint Institute for Regional Earth System Science and Engineering. In addition to his scientific work, he's the author of the book, Being the Change, Live Well and Spark a Climate Revolution. Um, a documentary by the same title complements the book. And in addition to authoring articles about climate change, he's the founder of the website noflyclimatesci.org which I visited and which is very cool, and co-founder of the app Earth Hero Climate Change, which you guys may also be familiar with. So we are very honored to have you here today. Welcome, Peter. Sure. 
uh, the first video, I should be, those are the slides, yeah, I should be in order. <laughs> We're gonna have a complicated audio visual thing here. And I'm gonna try not to take more than half an hour, but I'm not very good at that. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll start, I'll start that in just a second. Mm -hmm, thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, it's amazing to be here. This is my favorite kind of sort of presentation to do. The, the wisdom that is in this room is kind of mind-blowing if you think about it, even though we're only a few dozen people. But um, I, I want every one of you to realize that you have a piece of the puzzle um, and I want you all to think about how you can activate your piece of the puzzle more powerfully going forward than you ever have before and with courage and with a sense that you are super important in this, I, I will call it a real fight, maybe even a war, because um, I, I'm gonna get into some, a little bit of scary stuff in my presentation a little bit and I think that uh, if we, if this was 30 years ago when we were having this talk, I'd say we were probably going to avoid the worst damage and the largest number of deaths, and I don't think that that's possible anymore. So, and I think it's important to look at that honestly. So, it's a, it's a war where I think a lot of lives over the next few decades are going to be lost, and we're going to be all called to show up in, in a, in a real way, not on social media, you know, not you know, in a, in a kind of shirking way where you don't want to have conflict and talk to people about hard things, but where we're going to be called on for wisdom, for conflict resolution, for food production, for security, for community, in a, in a way that's going to be deeply human, probably really scary at times, um, and just going to like ask for all of us. Um, so I, I wanted you to kind of think about that a little bit. <sighs> But yeah, the, I agreed with, <laughs> I resonated with everything you all were saying about deep time and about processing climate emotions and about, um, you know, how we are sitting in this environment with each other and how it's like a full person, sort of animal, mamma, mammalian thing, right? So um, I, I think in this capitalism that we have, you know, where you can just order stuff on Amazon and it shows up, you know, in a few hours at your door. Um, we've kind of forgotten that we're mammals uh, on a planet that need food and water and proper temperatures and maybe most importantly, community to survive. Like we're a particular kind of mammal that we die if we don't have community. So it's, it's, it's gonna get real and that's gonna be scary, but in some ways it's gonna be amazing. So okay, um, I'm gonna start off by showing you a few videos. Um, this, the first two are from this project I co-founded with a dear friend, Harold Moss, who lives in New York State, called the Climate Ad Project, and we recently changed to being the Undeniable Network. So this first video is about carbon offsets. Um, we, we, we're trying to, one of the things that I see a lot out there in the public um, is just a great amount of ignorance. Like I talk to people, I'm like, like, what do you think's causing climate change? And I much more often get the response like it's plastics or uh, it's not enough recycling or it's not enough composting. Very few people actually tell me it's fossil fuels, right? There's, and, and then like the people who do understand that, say like going on long flights is not, I'm not saying that you necessarily shouldn't right now. Interestingly, so the no fly, so I haven't flown in, since 2012. I never took a pledge not to fly. Um, and I, all of my friends who go on flights, they always kind of come to me and sort of ask me for permission first and they're all guilty and they're like, I'm so sorry, I'm gonna take a flight somewhere. I'm like, I'm not the person who says whether you can fly or not. And, and <laughs> would you please, if you are gonna fly, could you please be an advocate for ramping down that entire system of commercial aviation? So it's only three or 4% of the cause of global heating because you know, the cars and heating our buildings and the industry, all this other stuff we do, the you know, animal agriculture, it's all that, those pieces are bigger pieces of what's causing global heating than just commercial aviation. But commercial aviation is growing exponentially and I see it as a real luxury. Like if we ended commercial aviation today, people would be inconvenienced but nobody would die. Uh, unlike if we kind of took fossil fuels out of agriculture today uh, or, or out of electricity, 
or out of heating homes, actually a lot of people would die, right? So it's harder to get fossil fuels out of those systems. Commercial aviation, we could end immediately if we wanted to. So I see it as a litmus test. You will know that society has transitioned into what I call climate emergency mode when the aviation industry stops growing exponentially but starts coming down. When you start seeing things like, you know, tickets getting more expensive based on the number of miles that you've flown in the last year, or uh, frequent flyer programs, programs becoming illegal, things like that, sort of the beginning of rationing, maybe nationalization of flying so that people, uh, executives aren't making huge amounts of money killing our earth, which goes 100 times more for the fossil fuel industry. But so I see flying as it's really an interesting problem to me because people freak out when they say, yeah, if we want to deal with global heating and earth breakdown, we're going to have to stop flying. They're always like, well, what about electric planes? I'm like, they're good for like three or 400 miles, but right now the batteries are 10 times too heavy per unit of energy to go in planes and go across oceans. They're like, what about biofuels? And I'm like, well, yeah, we'd have to like change all of our, you know, we, we, we'd have to cut down the Amazon rainforest, right, and grow uh, vegetable oil for all the planes, right? There's just not enough vegetables. I used to run a car on veggie oil, right? So I know. I've done a lot of research into production of vegetable oil. There's just the scale of fuel used to in commercial aviation and all the stuff we do. It's kind of mind-boggling, and like the fossil fuel industry, if you notice, they've been very careful that nobody knows how much stuff is actually going into your car, or into the wings of those planes, and being burnt and released into the atmosphere. When I was driving the veggie oil car, I used to carry these five gallon vegetable oil jugs around. They weighed about 40 pounds, 80 pounds carrying it, lugging it around. Um, and then it would you know, take like, one, just, just one of those would uh, make my car go 100 miles, right? We did, we did one 6,000 mile trip and we went out up to Portland and to Chicago and then back to Los Angeles. And I had this like, this, this trailer full of these vegetable oil cubies. <laughs> and I think it weighed like 3,000 pounds or something. There was one time in Oregon where I like detached it from the trailer hook, so we were gonna look at some like possible places to live, and I didn't realize that it was on a slight slope going down, and there was a canal right behind it, and I'm like struggling to keep this thing from going. I, I think I was like, put put a log under the wheel or something like that. We we I'm like this is gonna be like a big. I was thinking to myself, this is gonna be a big story. Like like climate scientist like dumps toxic chemicals into canal, right? Because it's like used vegetable oil. So, so it's just a lot of stuff. You like fill up your car and th the pump's going for a couple minutes and it's just a lot of stuff. And we're talking like 40 billion tons per year of carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere, which is why the atmospheric CO CO2 fraction is going up more or less exponentially. It's starting to slow down a little bit, but since 1790, it's been going up at over uh, on average 2% per year. So okay, so this is one, so this is one um, video we made uh, with a climate ad project uh, a couple years ago. And I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to. I like it. Okay, so I'm gonna make it big. I'm gonna make it big first. And I'm gonna press play. And after the murder. Meaning the murderer must be. <laughs> Lord Reginald. Brilliant, Holmes. Bravo. But you failed to account for one thing. I purchased a murder offset. A what? I went to London to find Jack the Ripper and paid him not to murder for a month. So you see, Mr. Holmes, on the whole, the world is in fact a little less murdery. <laughs> That's the stupidest shit I ever heard. Yeah, and so um, that website, we, we cite a lot of research. Some of it's from ProPublica, uh, other sources. I mean, carbon offsets, they are as stupid. It turns out they're just as stupid as they sound, if you sort of think about it. And yet, they allow people, for example, to get on planes and then not feel guilty, right? Um, it's this bullshit from the fossil fuel industry, which is keeping people who would otherwise be advocates for changing systems to not be advocates for changing systems, right? So they're very dangerous for that reason. Okay, here's a much more recent um, video we made after we changed into the 
undeniable network. Uh, hold on a second. I got to last infinity stone right yes giving me the power to do anything in the universe yeah and then i snap my fingers mm -hmm. and boom half of all sentient life just disappears <laughs> wait why again to stop overconsumption. why didn't you just Use the Infinity Stones to distribute resources equitably and stabilize consumption within ecological limits to create a sustainable post-scarcity utopia. Shut up! That's why! <laughs> anyway, long story short, the Avengers stopped me. But it was still pretty cool. Oh. Very evil. Love the creativity. Well, you know what that makes you, right? Uh... Makes you a loser. Do you even know who you're talking to? Yes, a fucking loser. Who is this guy? Hey, you're that CEO, right? <laughs> Oil, gas, coal. I supply the world's energy demand. And I'm sick of listening to you dipshits complain about your glorious evil plans being ruined by some arsehole in a leotard. Pathetic. Yeah, well, actual supervillains are having a conversation here, so get lost. Do you know why you keep losing? Why? Because you believe you're actually the hero in your own story. Me? I gave that up long ago. And what did you steal? Office supplies? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've stolen much more than that. Yeah? Like what? The future. I don't get it. Think back. For a brief, shining moment, everyone knew fossil fuels were killing the planet. Global warming meant I needed to be out of business. So ask yourselves, why am I still here? Because I stole it. The future. I took it. And all I needed to do was limit what people believed was possible. I bought PR firms, ad agencies, politicians, think tanks, judges, my own experts, even men of God. And it worked. And no one could stop me because it was all perfectly legal. One of the perks of writing your own laws. You wanted to know who I am? I'm every gas-guzzling car on the road. Every plane in the sky. Every shitty piece of plastic in your house. I'm the food you eat and the air you breathe. I am the system. So when the seas swallow your cities, when your crops fail and your governments collapse, when the scorching heat kills millions, leaving the human detritus to inundate your borders, I'll be safe and sound, watching the end unfold from the comfort of my luxury bunk, secure in the knowledge that I won. Yo, that's fucked up. Yeah, How that's you absolutely you ashamed of yourself. Mm. Riddle me this, asshole! What am I supposed to do with my crime empire when Gotham is six feet underwater? Move to fucking Boise! Oh my god, this guy's so evil! We have to let him into our club! He's right. All in favor? Aye! Hey, next round's on me. And then the credits roll, but okay, I'm gonna pause it there. So yeah, um, we so I uh, several years ago I just posted on Twitter. I'm like, it's crazy that there's no kind of ad agency sticking up for the earth, and I also think it's crazy that the Biden administration hasn't done anything to push back against extremely well-funded disinformation spread by the fossil fuel industry. If I were president, that's like the first thing I would do, sign on day one, I'd like have an executive order that said, here's how much money we're gonna spend, we're gonna have billboards, we're gonna have radio spots, we're gonna have shows on you know, PBS, just like things for classroom teachers pushing. The fossil fuel industry uh, literally funds uh, these like little textbooks for, for uh, elementary education classes for teachers, uh, especially in red states, that say climate change is a hoax. 
right? And so these teachers get this, these free materials and then teach this bullshit to the kids. You also notice that I, I don't shy away from saying swear words, right? Because this is a fucking emergency and I think it, it's, it was far too, the climate movement was being super polite for far too long. But yeah, so this is, we, we do this under the auspices of a 501c3 that, that I co-founded called Climate Science Education Project. We have big plans. The first couple of years, we were a group of like five volunteers. That's when we made the, the murder offset video, a bunch of other videos. We have a lot of videos that are kind of about current events. We had one when Amy Coney Barrett was in the process of being ordained into the Supreme Court. And she actually literally said that um, climate change was uh, a matter of public debate and that it wasn't settled, right? So she's literally a climate denier. So we, we, we put out that video, that went really viral. I featured a professor here at Duke that was a good friend of mine named Drew Schindel when he was testifying in front of Congress. He's so just such a, such a good job kind of bringing the science in a really serious and powerful way. So he was featured in that video. So we made a whole bunch of videos. Then we kind of burned out as a group because we were volunteers. Um, and then eventually we got like a $60,000 grant from the Climate Emergency Fund. Um, they're also friends of mine, although they, they super won't give us money again because they just like funding civil disobedience and this doesn't quite, it's, it's supports, but it's not actually civil disobedience. But we'll get to that in, in just a second. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think that this is really important stuff. Uh, I still don't understand why me as a, as a climate scientist at NASA, like why do I have to do this? I don't understand where are the people who are actually in media? Like why is a climate scientist co-founding a media group, a nonprofit media group for pushing back against in disinformation from the fossil fuel industry. And that's what I mean, like, you know, you guys are lawyers, you're, um, you know, doing all this, whatever you're doing, right? Do, doing all these different jobs, teaching, um, helping people, like taking care of people's health. Um, we, I, I feel like we all need to step forward to, to do stuff like this. And there are a f handful of lawyers that are doing things like starting to sue the fossil fuel industry, but it should be like hundreds, it should be thousands of lawyers doing that. I don't, I don't know why, people aren't really showing up yet. I mean, I kind of do. It's sort of because the mainstream media is not doing a proper job letting the public know that this is a fucking climate emergency, right? So anytime people die in a climate fire on Maui, anytime there's climate flooding in Vermont, the New York Times runs an article, right? And it says, you know, like, like talks to some scientists saying like this was 70% more likely because of global heating or whatever they probably just say climate change I, 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 I'm very very specific in the language I use I, I use global heating uh, earth breakdown climate change for very specific things but we can, I don't have time to talk about that right now but they don't what the New York Times doesn't say for example there's three really important things that they should say every single time there's a climate disaster and they never say it and it drives me insane because they're these fucking gatekeepers for our culture. The New York Times, in my opinion, is doing so much to prevent climate action around the world. I, I don't, yeah, I, I've, I've, I've pitched so many op-eds to, to their opinion desk and they're always like, how does this advance the conversation? I'm like, it's, no one's ever said this before. That's how it advances the conversation. And then they'll publish something about like, like you know, the importance of veganism and it's like literally the, the a story that's been written a thousand times in various forms, right? It just drives me crazy. The three things they need to start saying every time there's a climate disaster. Number one, this is because of the fossil fuel industry. That's part of the story. They're not doing good reporting if they leave that out. Number two, the fossil fuel industry has been literally lying and colluding to disinform the public, contribute to politicians' campaigns, and block action, and write their own laws through like ALEC and, and various other mechanisms, right? And they've been doing that for half a century. And they just promised in 2021 to keep doing it, and I can talk about that a little bit. Six uh, fossil fuel executives t went and testified under oath in front of Congress. They were asked repeatedly if they would stop spending money to spread disinformation and block action, and they refused to, to do that. They, they blathered and filibustered, and the, you know, Ro Khanna was like, all right, you're filibustering. I, like, technically, like, legally speaking, I take that as a no. You are not going to stop spending to spread disinformation, right? Um, so that's the second thing. 
the third thing the New York Times has to say anytime there's a climate disaster and they don't is what's going to happen 10 years from now, what's going to happen 20 years from now, what's going to happen 50 years from now, because this is all a trend. And every molecule of carbon dioxide, every gram of oil or gas or coal that's burned makes the planet a little bit hotter irreversibly, right? And so the public just doesn't know. Um, okay, uh, so on that note, something else I do that I think is really important is civil disobedience. So I'm gonna play one more video for you. So I'm here because scientists are not being listened to. I'm willing to take a risk for this gorgeous planet. <laughs> I've been trying to warn you guys for so many decades that we're heading towards a fucking catastrophe. And we've been being ignored. The scientists in the world have been being ignored. And it's gotta stop. We're gonna lose everything. And we're not joking. We're not lying. We're not exaggerating. This is so bad, everyone, um, that we're willing to take this risk. And more and more scientists and more and more people are gonna start joining us. This is for all of the kids in the world, all the young people, all of the future people. This is so much bigger than any of us. So that's probably enough. That was the first time I risked arrest and then eventually was arrested. And Sharon came and she was there with me. And, um, and it felt like, I felt like the next day, there is a pretty good chance I'd get fired from my job. And, um, but it was the, probably one of the most powerful things I've done in my entire life. And um, because somehow I was able to tap into the emotion in that moment and it actually got caught in film, it went super viral, um, especially outside of the US. It, you know, everything I do, frustratingly, like does better outside of the US. Um, because I think just the individualism here and the, <sighs> there's this, this thing, this narrative that you have to be hopeful and you can't scare people too much. And a lot of moderate climate advocates, I think, use that to get on MSNBC and to get on CNN and to get into the New York Times. Um, but those venues, I, I feel like they don't, uh, they don't want to highlight the voices that are you know, kind of threatening to the status quo and threatening to the system. Um, and so, but, but in, especially in developing nations, they don't have that same thing. Like I was just on Bolivian national TV a couple of years ago, uh, a couple of days ago, and it was amazing. And it like has a really big impact in a country like that. So, okay, I bet you, how much time do I have? Is it negative or do I kind of go f like five more minutes? <laughs> Oops, this is the wrong one. Um, uh, this is Natalia's. Uh, I can go here and then I can click on this. So, yeah. This is it. Yeah. Oh, okay, sorry. So I'll go through this really fast. Um, I, I just wanted to say that this, I wanted to give you a scope of what I do and who I am so that we could just kind of prime the discussion because that's kind of the main thing. Um, this slide to me, it represents deep time, uh, it represents the planet, it represents the cosmos. This little, that, that bright galaxy there, well that's the Milky Way of course, and then that's the Andromeda galaxy, which is heading straight towards us. <laughs> it's gonna show up in about 3.7 billion years. Um, this is the pale blue dot, that's our planet. This is from a NASA JPL satellite, literally orbiting Saturn, taking a photo of the fucking Earth, and I'm there waving up at everybody, because and we all went out, at JPL, we all went outside, and we're like, oh, Cassini's gonna take a photograph of Earth, and we're facing Saturn right now, so wave, everyone. <laughs> so it's super cool, so I'm literally waving. Everything we know, uh, all of his human history, all of our drama, all of our love, all of our conflict is happening on that pale blue dot, and it's super fragile, that's what we know now. Um, this is ocean heat content increasing over the last several years. 93% uh, of the excess energy uh, coming into the Earth relative to what's going out from the Earth is going into the oceans. Global surface temperature, same story. Um, this is the CO2 fraction, like I said. I, I just fitted this with a dumbass exponential curve with two parameters. And so it starts in about 1790, which is, I think, uh, the cotton gin, right? It wasn't that Eli Whitney, like the start of the Industrial Revolution, basically coal and yeah, and then it's increasing at 2.2% per year on average. No matter where you look in the Earth system, you see 
just when I was an astrophysicist before 2012, like when I and when I first started being a climate activist in 2006, there was a lot of discussion about whether the climate signal had already been emerging in the Earth system, like how if you could t pull it out with subtle data science techniques from the data sets. Now it's just like this huge, huge, strong signal that's everywhere you look in the Earth system, and you know storms getting more severe, and plants and animals both in the ocean and on land moving towards the poles. Um, ice sheets melting, glaciers melting, uh, you know, the sea expanding thermally and sea level rising. So no matter where wildfire is getting worse, just like you can't, there's no part of the living earth really that you can look at and not see the imprint of global heating. We're at 1.3 degrees Celsius above where we would be if we hadn't been burning all this fossil fuel. Um, and it's increasing roughly at uh, a tenth of a degree Celsius every five years. So in about 10 years in the early 2030s, we'll be at 1.5 degrees Celsius. But it looks like it might be accelerating somewhat. The last 15 years have been increasing, the global mean temperature has been increasing about 40% faster than from 1970 to like 2000. We all know what the summer was like, it was insane. Uh, climate scientists, in my opinion as a climate scientist, we climate scientists do not understand exactly why 2023 was so different than 2022 and 2021. We got kind of used to a little bit of increase every year, and then suddenly 2023 happened and it blew away everything, and that's very concerning to me. Um, this is the work that I do. Um, what my, my favorite project is looking at future projections of how um, extreme humidity and heat is going to affect human bodies around the world. Um, it's a, it's a lot to unpack in a very short amount of time. I, I can't, so the top two rows, that's the baseline, 1890s average, 1990s average. What I'm showing, those, those, the, the colors, that's the number of days per year over a particular threshold of humid heat, which is what an ideally healthy human, perfectly acclimatized to heat, couldn't do better in, in hot and humid conditions, will experience hyperthermia, which is when the core, their core body temperature starts to increase and they go, start to go into heat stroke. Um, during the hottest part of the day, just walking, that's what light work means. So that if you're running a marathon, then this would be even more purple, right? And if you're lying in bed resting, it would be less purple because your metabolic rate exposes you more or less to extreme humid heat conditions. But you can see that in the 2190s and the 2290s, then the, the columns, the two right-hand columns, that's for if humanity prioritizes growth over climate mitigation, which is what we're literally doing right now. Like, look at, you know, I hate the Republicans with a passion. They're evil and awful, and they say climate change is a hoax. But President Biden and this White House, they've still been expanding fossil fuel basically just as fast as Trump ever did. And it doesn't matter whether the CO2 molecule is emitted by a Democrat president or a Republican president, it's gonna heat the planet exactly the same way. So we are literally on this like prioritizing growth over mitigation scenario. The one on the left, that's if we seriously prioritize mitigation. You can see in the 2090s, 2190s, it kind of peaks out in the 2090s, uh, basically 2100, and then eventually the temperatures slowly start to come down. But under the growth scenario, the non-mitigation scenario, everything just kind of blows up after 2100, and the, you know, the whole planet basically turns purple, which means almost every single day per year in that location is going to be beyond this dangerous heat threshold. And this is the same thing, but for an even more extreme threshold. So this, these are fatal humid heat conditions. You'll die if you're exposed to them for more than a few minutes. While you're at rest, lying down at bed, at the coolest time of day, in the middle of the night. Um, and remember, this is for an ideally healthy person. So if you have any pre-existing conditions, you're taking certain medications, you're you know, above the age of 60, so you're not perspiring as much, it's gonna be much, much worse than this. But um, this is like an average climate sensitivity model. Um, it basically, well, this one's a slightly hotter than the average. This one's average. But after, before 2100, you don't see this anywhere on Earth, these, these, this extreme conditions. Um, after 2100, if we don't mitigate, you have these wide swaths in the tropic where, you know, some places, you know, over 100 days per year are beyond these conditions. So that's essentially uninhabitability, right? So I'm almost done. I'm going to skip this. We can talk about it uh, in Q&A if you want, but this is the irreversibility stuff. This is biodiversity 
uh, so going back to deep time, like my experience of deep time is holy shit, I want to get arrested as much as I can because it's going to, the, we're, the damage we're doing right now, these few years, will last for 10 million years, right, in terms of biodiversity loss. That's the longest time scale of global heating impacts. Um, this was an op-ed I wrote uh, that went live yesterday in Newsweek. COP28 is a sick joke. You should be angry and afraid. You can read it. It's in Newsweek. Just Google Newsweek Calamus and you'll find it. Um, the thing that's interesting is I have a really good relationship with this Newsweek editor, and um, uh, I, I can use that venue as a way to shift language around climate change. So I even used the word bullshit, he changed it to crap. But, um, but basically, I don't pull any punches when I talk about the fossil fuel industry and how the United Nations has been corrupted. I say that um, uh, these are basically, I name those six CEOs who testified in 2021 and explain that whole thing. I basically say they're like among the most evil human beings on the entire planet. Um, it's easy to imagine an alternate universe in which fossil fuel executives were like, hey, we already have more money than we know what to do with, so maybe let's not destroy the planet. But in reality, of course, fossil fuel executives made the opposite choice, to spend billions to hire the best and brightest to spread disinformation and block action. Um, I think we'll save this for a discussion. I, I have like a kind of a three-part, sort of three-pronged idea of how to make change. Uh, which we can talk about. You develop yourself first. You engage in what Gandhi called constructive program. That means joining together, uh, doing stuff like this, uh, doing stuff like what Saskia is doing with the Duke Farm, creating a climate resilient community, right? That's constructive program, taking care of each other and starting to build the alternative. Super important. And then the third one is uh, the civil disobedience and the blowing up pipelines and all of that, right? And that's the tip of the iceberg. And you can't really do that effectively if you haven't done the other two. Like, to do civil disobedience, it took, for the four of us that got arrested in the action that I showed, there were like 20 other people that were supporting us. And then to, to be the ones to get arrested and take that risk, we had to do serious inner work, right? To be ready for that. And I, I can tell you, it was scary as fuck to get arrested like that. A hundred cops in riot gear showed up. I thought I was gonna get fired. I didn't know how my colleagues would react to it. I didn't know what was, you're jumping into this uncertainty, like you don't know what you're gonna get charged with or how serious it's gonna be. So you, you can't do that unless you've, you've done that inner work, which for me involves a lot of meditation. <laughs> this is uh, my, so this is my slide for the inner work. This is my slide for the constructor program. Bees are super awesome and I love them. Um, and this is the slide for the Satyagraha. Um, I also study coral reefs. So um, yeah, I hope I've inspired you to kind of dig a little deeper, uh, to work together, to support each other, to make even more change than you've been doing. And this is what the night sky is going to look like in 3.7 uh, billion years when Andromeda is just about to crash into the Milky Way. Um, and uh, you know, I, I don't know, like I feel really called, I feel really grateful to exist as a human being in this body, and to be here with you guys, and to be here with Sharon and my boys. I, I you know, we, we all owe everything to this planet, and I think the planet is, uh, it's a living being, and um, you know, anyway, it's uh, the privilege of a lifetime to be called to serve it and to give back. So, um, thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, we are going to take a brief uh, break. If you need to use the restroom, there's just there's one here. Um, stretch your legs. Uh, there's a couple of cookies and brownies left, and we will reconvene in just about five minutes or so um, for Natalia's presentation.
give you a little intro. Okay, if we can make our way back to our seats, we're gonna get started again in about uh, half a minute, a minute or so. All right, everybody, we're going we're gonna to continue with our program on to our second presenter. I'm now so pleased to introduce artist Natalia Torres del Vi. I should have asked you. Vi, okay. Vi. I love Natalia's paintings, which seem to hold opposing qualities in the same supple hand. They are somehow simultaneously stark and lush, the colors both bold and soothing, the forms simple and dynamic. As with a Rothko, I feel I could gaze at her work on panel for hours, or perhaps years, or maybe through deep time. Natalia is also an arts therapist, supporting clients in integrating their thoughts, emotions, and sensations through creative expression, something I think we'll learn uh, more about today. Um, so for the bio, Natalia Torres Del Valle is an artist who works out of her studio in Hillsboro, North Carolina, and a 2023 Acadia National Park artist in residence. She is a registered expressive arts therapist through the International Expressive Arts Therapy Association and a licensed clinical mental health counselor associate. Her work is created with foraged soils and rocks, earth-based pigments, and lake pigments, pigments from plants. Her process often entails discovering what is underneath the surface and responding to the unpredictable forms that emerge. She repeatedly builds up and erodes the image to break down layers of color, mirroring the erosion of the environment. A constant exploration of the ephemerality of a material landscape and memory. Welcome, Natalia. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for those kind words about my work um, also. Um, I just want us to all take um, a collective breath or scream <laughs> if you need to do that too. Um, that's how I feel right now. Um, so let's just take a moment to do that. Uh, yeah. Oh, oh my gosh. Um, Thank you, Sarah Rose, for bringing us all together in community today. I think that's really where we find healing. And thank you, Peter, for the important work that you do. Um, I really appreciate the directness of your work. Um, so thank you for that. So today, I'm gonna just going to share a little bit about my work, um, some images so you can see how these pigments look on paper. And I brought some show and tell things um, we can, you can look at after um, I talk to you. I might pass some things around. Um, and then I wanted to provide some space after for some uh, writing and reflection. I feel really grateful that I'm here on the last one, this last session of the year. So um, I thought that would be nice to, to have some time for that. So that'll be the majority of my speaking time today. Okay, so um, as Sarah said, I'm an artist, expressive arts therapist, and educator out in Hillsboro, North Carolina. Um, in my talk today, I still have a lot to learn. It's a continual learning process working with forged pigments since they have also they have a mind of their own. So I'm definitely happy to answer questions about the process and um, provide resources to you that might be helpful. And then, um, yeah, let's get started. Okay, so for, for me, my arts therapy practice and arts practice have similar approaches. Being present, being open to unpredictability and shifts, and the process, of, the process of art making be more meaningful for me than the product. Um, both in my art practice and therapy practice, the foundation is the relationship. And that's something we talked about in our small group today. Um, thank you for opening with that. 
Um, one with the natural world and the other the individual, and this also this idea of reciprocity. Um, I shifted to using natural materials only last year. Um, I was making a lot of work with epoxy resin and paint skins, and a lot of the forms were reminiscent of fungi and mushrooms, and um, I would hike out into the woods for inspiration and then come back to my studio, and at the end of the day, I was throwing away so much waste and material, and it just didn't sit right with me. Um, so it didn't feel good to me to be creating art about nature and in turn creating so much waste. So if you haven't read Jason Logan's book, uh, Make Ink, it's really great. Um, so one day my youngest and I just went out into the yard and we found a bunch of pokeberry and smushed it up and painted with it and that was like the beginning. I never turned back from that. Um, it was amazing to me just how much color was just in my backyard. Um, black walnuts, uh, iris, we made, we made iris ink, um, and then being in Orange County, this, the variety of color and soil um, all around us. Um, my work now is also allowing me to process my own eco grief and create something tangible to process it. So at the beginning of our time together today, we were talking about like, what, what do we do to help us process you know, our um, climate emotions and talking about meditation or going on walks. And for me, it's making art. Um, and I think all of us being here together today have the desire to see change and the fact that there needs to be change uh, illuminates uh, loss. So we'll be reflecting on this later today. Um, so I'm not a purist. You'll see there's some things um, that I've, I've thrifted. Um, no one can be perfect. I'm trying to make shifts in my studio and be more reflected on where, reflected on where I can make, um, reduce my environmental, environmental impact. So um, I'm gonna share some work with you that I've made. Um, my abstract paintings on wood panel and even my botanical drawings are catalogs of pigment for me, uh, which is more important to me than the image itself. I've been reflecting a lot on this lately and how the process of making material is the art. So all of these pigments to me, and um, I'll pass these around, to me that's art, the, the process of making it. Um, and I hope it encourages folks to be curious think where they can find color. Um, and I found this with my own children too. Uh, they're always wondering like, would this, if we scratch this rock, will this make color? If we boil this plant, will this make a color? Um, and, and that's just been in the last year and it's really encouraging my own children to wanna be outside more and, and be curious. Um, so I'm just gonna pass these around. Um, these are lake pigments um, made from soil or from plants and then there's some soil pigments too. Um, I just, I, every time I make a pigment, I just keep a little bit just to notice how it changes over time. So I'm just gonna pass it. Okay. So this is um, in the middle of me mulling a uh, watercolor uh, made from Brazil wood. And then this is local um, rock that I foraged and safflower, a muller print of safflower. And I'll pass some muller prints that I have too. Um, the process of making flake pigments is definitely feels like, my, my dad is a chemist and it is funny when I started doing this, he's like, oh, finally we have a chemist in the family. And I, I just never thought of my, my work that way. Um, but I, he's always giving me like remnants from his, uh, from his lab. I just made some watercolor paint with some algae he had in his lab. Um, so uh, on the lower left is local soil pigment that I made, um, blue cabbage uh, and safflower. And I do, I really do love making lake pigments. Um, for me, I'm really interested in soil pigments, rock pigments and uh, making uh, pigment from trash. So uh, an example of that would be copper scraps that I find around. Um, it makes this really beautiful copper ink, which has a mind of its own. And over time it will, this feels good guys. Over time it, it will oxidize and create its own texture. So it's really unpredictable. Um, I have an example of um, one in person you can see over there. Um, but I process it, this has gone through several batches. Um, and then I'll pour it over a coffee filter, and then I'll get more of a hardened version, and this is what I use to make watercolor, and that's more shelf stable than the ink. How do you get the, um, oh, no, this is, I'm a teacher too, so I'm like, please ask questions. Well, I want to repeat my question so yeah. people are smart. How do you get it to dry out? Like, what, the liquid is, does it have? 
it just, it's just over, so after I process it maybe like five times, it'll start to get kind of, it'll make like a crusty layer. Um, and then I'll pour that out to make the ink, but then left behind on the coffee filter is that, that crust. Mm -hmm. And I break it down with soil, or soy, with salt and uh, vinegar. Um, but you can get different results, like if I were to use seawater versus just like table salt versus kosher salt versus, I mean, there's, it's, they all have their own like pH. Um, I'm gonna pass this in. And that's very, um, you don't wanna touch that. <laughs> like when you open it up, it's very, yeah. Uh, but yeah, these are some examples um, on these two. Um, this is the copper ink. This is the copper ink, and then this is the copper watercolor, and they behave differently um, on the paper. On the left, that's indigo, um, oak gall ink, which I'll pass this around. Um, I just used all the oak galls that I foraged, so I, I got some, for so just so you could see it. Uh, sap and wood and more indigo. Um, so these are really fun to find. Um, you can find them on a variety of trees, but oak is the most prevalent. And sometimes you'll see holes in them, because that's where wasps like to lay their eggs, and then they'll emerge um, from there. But um, what I do, it's just a medieval recipe. You crush it up and add iron, um, and it'll oxidize over time. So I brought some for you guys, and I'm happy to paint some um, afterwards so you can see how that shifts and how that changes. Um, and these are more drawings. This is a recent um, series I've been working on um, using oat gall ink and uh, forged um, color. And these are some of my works on panel. The one on the left are those two um, prema, uh, the orange and the browns are from Hillsborough and Durham. Um, and there's yellow ochre underneath this one. So a lot of the times when I'm building a painting, there's lots of layers underneath. And I use um, an eco uh, paint thinner. Uh, to erode the layers or sand down the layers. Um, and then I also use an eco acrylic, so it doesn't, it's not made of plastic, so it doesn't behave quite like a typical acrylic. Um, it's a little more fluid. And then I had fun with this series. Um, so uh, I recently, or uh, I went to Acadia last year um, with my family and then recently just came back for an artist in residency. Um, and so this white is mixed with a little bit of titanium, but it's snail shell, um, and then ash from my fireplace. Um, and then this yellow ochre is from Hillsborough. And then um, in, uh, in Hillsborough, there's lots of old mills, so there's lots of just bra brick scraps everywhere, so I love using brick. Um, it's very cathartic to you to, be, to smash it up. Um, so <laughs> there's brick, and pom this yellow is pomegranate. So at my house, my uh, family, they'll always ask, like, Mom, is it OK? Could we move these like onion scraps? It's been here for like two weeks. And so there's just piles of things all around my house. I need to do a better job. But um, yeah, I, I, I love to use food waste in my work, too. Okay. So when I'm foraging, I never take more than what I need, um, and there's no perfect way to do this. It's just more of like a knowing. Um, and I really love Tilka Elkin's work of the Wild Pigment Project. I would really encourage, if you're interested in this topic, I'd really encourage you to look up um, her work. Um, but she has guiding principles for foraging that I also like to follow. And I won't go into all of them, but, um, but the first one is that I will read is, the world is alive, all land, water, beings, and elementals are alive and capable of communication with human beings. And then the most important one to me is reciprocal foraging. Um, and to me, um, my art feels like it's reciprocity and donating certain percentages of my work to organizations that I believe in um, and just being able to talk to folks like you guys today. And then there's also gifts offered to the land by reciprocal foragers, um, respect, observation and curiosity, personal integrity, giving thanks, giving time, giving money, and sharing wisdom. 
And I also brought you all <laughs> a gift today, which I will uh, do a pre-shake um, before you leave. But I made everybody um, yellow ochre watercolor from Hillsborough that you can take with you today. <laughs> um, okay. So uh, part of my work, too, is an expressive arts therapist. And I really resonated when you were talking about working with or your own children. Um, as a mother myself, I can, you can feel the heaviness that they feel. Um, and then in my work as an expressive arts therapist, that is a topic that comes up frequently, especially among teenagers, um, and their experience of eco-grief and anxiety around climate change. Um, so I wanted to share um, uh, art experiential, some writing, so we can have time to process and get a new perspective on what we're feeling in a new way. So with that in mind, I brought some, some might be wet because it was raining this morning, so just be mindful of that. But I brought a variety of natural items that I had in my studio and just around my house. So what I, want you, I would like to offer you is to choose an item um, and with all of these prompts, if you want to go in a different direction, you can go, feel free to go in a different direction. So I want you to choose a natural object that reminds you of a time spent outside during your childhood. So we're going to go back in time and see if any memory is prompted. And if, if this so happens to be a memory that happened last week, roll with that. That's fine. Um, I want uh, and also to explore the object with your senses. Let's not do taste, <laughs> but all the other senses are a go. Really explore like rubbing the leaf against your ear, crunching it, or seeing what it sounds like against your chair, um, smelling it. So exploring this natural object in a way you might not typically, um, besides sight, which is what we always do. Um, and then, um, if you would, For those of you who are online, um, just look around you in the room where you are and see what is made um, from nature. It could even be the table that you're sitting at or your chair. Um, just pick something around you um, that's made from nature. So there's also a piece of paper. So we're going to fold it in half, and I'm going to gently guide you through these prompts as we go along. Um, so first, you're just going to pick a natural object. And then once you explore through the senses, just write down a list of all the things, all those words that come to mind when you explore this object through your senses. And when you're ready, you can go ahead and go look around. So there's pencils over there for you and colored pencils. Music is a good time. Also, if you're curious about any of these pigments, if that's something that speaks to you too, you feel free to grab one of those. Oh, thank you. Um, also, if there's any of these pigments up here, I, these are all made from natural objects. So if that speaks to you, feel free to grab something from the box. Does it smell good? 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't eat the berries. Yeah. <laughs> you can smush the berries. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's really, you have paper, so play around with like rubbing the leaf or whatever you have against your paper and see if it makes a color. We're gonna take about one more minute just to write, experience the natural object that you chose and write down a list of words that come to mind. And we're going to keep writing. So if you still have more words that you're wanting to add, don't worry. We're just everything's just a pause while I give directions. Okay. So I'm going to offer you an experiential today that I I like to do, um, just to help synthesize a variety of experiences. And today we're focusing on uh, potential eco grief that you're experiencing or climate change anxiety. Um, it's called a five-minute poem, <laughs> and I'll explain how it works, and this is something that you can repeat more than once with your free write, but um, writing, is, as Sarah Rose knows, is such an important way for us to process our experiences or address our experiences in a really direct way. So for about five minutes, we're going to free write about that memory that the object reminds you of. Um, and. I would like for your pencil or your pen to keep moving. So if you don't, if you're feeling stuck and you don't know what to write about, don't stop writing. Just write, I don't know what to write about. I don't know what to write about. And keep going until the end of the five minutes. And so uh, I will give you <laughs> uh, a minute, uh, just a heads up to pause. Um, but yeah, so what you're going to do for the next five minutes is just free write about this memory that the object reminds you of. And I'll give you a minute heads up before it's time to pause. And just a reminder, there's pens or pencils and paper if you need it.
going to take about one more minute. And just remembering that it's OK if you're not done writing. We're just going to find a place to pause. Start finding where you can start wrapping up your final thought. It was a little less than five minutes. All right, I'm just gonna pause there. So I lied, it's not really a five minute poem, but we're gonna do, <laughs> it's probably like a 10 minute poem. So, um, so now what you're gonna do is you're just gonna quickly look at your work, your writing, and choose five words that stand out to you, and not overthink it. If you're like, that's a weird word, just circle it anyways <laughs> if it stands out to you. So just quickly scan your writing, see what pops out. And then on the back of your paper, write those five words. And I'm just going to say the next part. 30 minutes goes by fast. <laughs> OK. So now we're going to create five phrases. So when let's not get stuck in our heads about poetry. <laughs> we're just going to create five phrases using your five words. Don't get stuck in your head. I see that encouragement over there. <laughs> While you're writing today, your five phrases, think about these are just some prompts to help you think about it. How you experience the vi environment now than when you were a child. If there's something you want to hold on to or leave behind, what do you grieve? What do you hope for moving forward? And this one came from you. What does a living future mean or look like to you? So once you have your five phrases using your five words, then you can rearrange them however makes sense for your work. And we'll just do this just for a couple minutes. One word per phrase, yeah. And it doesn't have to start, your word doesn't have to start your phrase off. It can be embedded anywhere in the middle of your phrase. And again, I'll give you a moment, or I'll give you a heads up. We're going to take about another minute or two, just remembering this is about the process. So if it's not finished, that's OK. Just being mindful of our time.
When you're done writing, go back into your free write and see if there's one more word that could serve as the title to your poem. And then to end this today, um, we're just gonna go back into the original groups that we had at the beginning of our time together. And these are just some questions to help guide your discussion. What surprised you? Did the poem shift your perspective of that experience? What are you still curious about? Again, what do you wanna let go of or hold on to? And what actions can you take in your life or in the greater community? So we're just gonna take about a minute since 30 minutes is, has arrived. So just circle up for about a minute and just reflect on this with your, your original group that you're paired with this morning. Okay, 30 minutes went by really, really fast. <laughs> so we're just gonna find a place to pause your thought. If you're the one speaking, just find a place to wrap up your thought and then we'll come back together. And I think we're gonna come together for discussion. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm, I'm gonna have all of these things for you to explore if you wanna look at them a little closer after, our, after we're done to, today. And just remember I have some watercolor stones for you too. Thank you so much, Natalia. That was really fun. Did you guys have fun? I thought that was fun. Um, thank you so much.
Um, and now, apparently, I'm just carrying this around with me everywhere. <laughs> um, so, um, so what we're going to do now is we are going to bring some chairs here. Let's um, let's actually scoot you guys. So now we get to talk after all of that wonderfulness. Um, so this this is can be Q and A. Obviously, we can ask questions, but you don't have to have a question. It can also just be a thought, a comment, something you would like them to respond to, something you just want to share with the group. Um, yeah, it can be a, a free flowing conversation to the extent that we're able to do with passing mics around. Um, if you, when you would like to talk, I can either um, hand you this mic if you'd like to stay in your seat, or you're also welcome to come up here and um, and ask a question, or you can say a question from where you are, and I can repeat it for you if that's more comfortable for you as well. So thinking about what resonated for you in these two presentations, what questions arose for you? I know we probably have some questions in our mental dockets ready to go. Um, what threads did you maybe see connecting the two presentations? Um, and then also, how can we think, feel, act differently as a result of them? What can we, what can we do in the different ways that we might do something? Um, does anybody want to start? I can start if nobody wants to, but. Um, I would like to um, start by maybe asking, I think, Peter, I'd like to hear you talk a little bit more about the three things that you were mentioning at the very end of your presentation that you had to move through quickly with the three different suggestions. And then maybe, um, in particular, I'm interested, I'm interested in, all, in you talking about all three of those, but in particular, what self, the self-development looks like. Um, and maybe even about some about your, your meditation practice. Yeah, thank you. So I've been a climate activist since 2006, and it's been a pretty wild ride. That's what, 18 years, I guess. And um, there's so much conflict and infighting and sort of ego and suffering and conflict in the activist community that I feel like it gets, it's holding itself back and people don't always feel safe and they don't feel beloved. And that's where I think the first two stages come in, the inner work and the constructive program. The, you know, the inner work is largely, in my opinion, about dissolving one's ego. So it's a lifelong thing, um, and it takes a lot of <laughs> humility and sensitivity, uh, and I've fallen down on my face so many times, and um, you know, and, and you have to be open to that, I guess, uh, because that's, I don't know, the ego it, it comes up in so many surprising ways. It's like, uh, it, it it gets you by surprise <laughs> in a way that you don't expect. Um, let's see, I don't know, like Sharon and I probably, we probably meditated each like more than 5,000 hours <laughs> in our life, right? You go to a, yeah, maybe more, I don't know. It's a lot. You go to a 10-day meditation course and sit for 10 hours a day and then you come home and you sit for an hour in the morning, an hour at night and you keep that going as long as you can and Sharon's been keeping it going now for like a couple of years and yeah four it's a long time and I think I, I've got my 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 I'm on, sort of on my record right now which is six months and I've I've seen my climate anxiety go like basically go down to zero when I'm meditating an hour in the morning an hour at night and kind of really putting in a strong effort to 
to not just sit there and think, but to actually be with my sensations and understand impermanence. Um, and then when I stop meditating and start, you know, watching Netflix at night and missing the morning sit because I didn't get enough sleep and then the practice erodes and then the anxiety spikes back up and I become impossible to live with basically and I can't write anymore. I can't do science anymore. So so that's that's the personal development. You you show up for yourself and you you'll deal with that anxiety and then you can show up for the community. And then the constructive program regenerative practices, conflict resolution, making space for other voices. And then just like the physical act of like, what is a, what is community resilience? What is a climate resilient community? Uh, like where is food coming from? Where is energy coming from? Is the community ready to, to protect the most vulnerable there? Is it ready to allow immigrants to come in from other countries and settle, or is it gonna like put up walls? So all of these kind of really deep questions um, about community resilience and safe spaces and showing up for each other. So those are the two, you know, and, and I think that the civil disobedience and the other kind of uh, sort of public facing activist uh, activities, they, will, I think they will only be as effective as those two foundational things. So you can think of it as an iceberg where you got underneath the water is that that's the personal uh, spiritual development. Then you've got this big part above the water, which is the constructive program, which you can see. And then you've got the very tip is the civil disobedience and uh, the satyagraha and the kind of creating, changing social norms and creating a sense well, I mean, it's all changing social norms, but kind of creating that sense of public urgency that's capable of pushing back against all of this corporate stuff. Who else has a question or a comment? I have a question. Um, I was just simply curious uh, as to your trajectory in your youth that uh, led you to become a scientist for NASA? Like, how did, what was your journey? How did that even come about? I love science fiction. I love Star Trek. I loved space stuff. I was really good at math and science, like in elementary school and high school. And, um, you know, I naturally gravitated toward NASA when I had a chance to work for NASA. I was like, that's the coolest thing in the world. <laughs> And then I, w I started out in astrophysics, and then in 2012, I, by 2012, I was so worried about climate change that I switched. Um, I have got a book, too. I was going to bring a bunch of copies, but I forgot them. But it's called Being the Change, and there's a, it's free online, too. But you can, get a you can get a paper copy of it or read the free version. The first chapter kind of tells that story. Yes. I, I don't have a question, but I uh, sometimes I write wishful thoughts, and I would like to share some with you, if that's okay. Um, in this one, I use old men as a description of uh, the current structure of society that's based on patriarchy hierarchy. Um, there is good and bad that have come through that, and I feel like the bad outweigh the good. And maybe these are wishful thoughts for a better future, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, let me see if I find it. Uh, the title is uh, Pandemic 45. Beginning of the end, age of madness ends, that, that creates creates nations, nations with borders of tensions, tensions that creates wars, wars that kill the young ones who died fighting for history world that they never knew but held into their imagination. No longer go sitting and de thinking, thinking, thinking of clinging, clinging to the history. History, I, I was told is mine. Don't one embrace the reality. My own reality, myth is the reality. So I, I hold, 
hold that, hold that mythology in my head, that, that creates, creates nations, nations with borders of tensions, tensions that creates wars, wars that kill the young ones who died fighting for lies planted in their imagination. Age of Madness ends with madmen in powerful positions, channels of communication used for corruption, creating confusion, hard to distinguish, truth from fiction. Do you see where it's going already? If you can distinguish fiction from the truth, what's next? Maybe waking up so you can see manipulation used for generation to create separation that, that creates, creates nations, nations with borders of tensions, tension that creates wars, wars that kill the young ones who die fighting for old, deranged men. Thank you for that. Yes. Yeah, thank you guys for these wonderfully uh, complimentary presentations. Um, Natalia, I was wondering if you could tell uh, uh, me, us more about your decision to shift into pigment painting away from, and what materials you were using before. And this is a question that I'm asking, kind of maybe other people already know about this and I don't, but like, is there a, I mean, acrylic paint is plastic, right? And oil painting is, I assume, oil. So is there a, like a, is there a history of environmental or colonial kind of extraction in in the materials themselves in painting that you know about? That's a great question. I would, that's something I would like to learn more about myself. Um, I'm not sure about the second part, but um, yeah, acrylic has um, plastic in it and oil painting, if you're using, I, I use oil um, in my work too, walnut oil and sometimes linseed oil, um, but with the pigments that either I create or um, I really like, um, uh, natural earth paints and they have pigments that are um, naturally sourced um, but yeah my my shift really just was started started last year so it's pretty still pretty fresh um, and it just just 180 um, in my studio um, it was just I was using uh, like a lots of epo epoxy resin and that creates yeah it's it's um, <laughs> it's a lot of waste and a lot of mess um, Depending on what, there's like, there's different varieties, but yeah, it's a lot of, there can't, there are some that are, but the epoxy that I was using was, was not. Um, and uh, I just, I just felt very contrarian to what the theme, the themes of my work were. Um, and then just generating so much waste in my studio, I just really, I just really felt like I needed to make a shift. Um, and then once I started realizing that color was just everywhere, um, a really fun thing to do is just to take a rock and scratch it against another rock and just see what happens. Mm. Um, but yeah, it just, it just felt really, I, I don't have a very like m logical answer, I guess, but it just, felt, it just felt aligned and it just felt right. And I just followed that. And I, I don't see myself going back to the kind of art I was making before. Can I ask you a follow-up question? Yes. Yeah, so the follow-up question, uh, you made this like really abrupt shift in your process. How did that change the actual finished product? Yeah, so the, my artwork looks completely different um, now. And my process is completely different too. Um, just like the amount of work that I make is way less. So that's been an interesting thing for me because it takes time to make it. Um, so yeah, the aesthetic is totally different. Um, and I'm okay with it. There's still textural elements, but um, yeah, it's been, it, it feels also more aligned with my therapy practice also. I feel like there's a lot more presence in the work that I'm making. Um, there's a lot more reflection. And um, I don't know if this is actually true or not, but um, someone told me, you know, when you're like mulling paint, uh, I'm gonna choose to believe this, if, even if it's not true. <laughs> um, but when you're mulling paint, that that word mulling, you, you sometimes are mulling paint for like, an hour until you get the consistency that's right. And so you're spending a lot of time thinking, a lot of time reflecting and just being really present with the material and witnessing it change. Um, and that also just felt, felt right to me too. Um, this is a question for each of you. I'm thinking about each of you as, as um, 
experts, maybe you wouldn't call yourselves of that, but experts of the change process. And I'm thinking about you, Peter, as someone who's sort of waking people up and calling attention um, to something. I'm thinking about your you know, media organization and um, Natalia Yu is someone who's helping like digest and change and activate people as well. Um, so I'm wondering what in that work, um, what, I, I know there's probably not one thing, but if you could share one thing that seems to really work um, to help people change, um, what kind of helps activate people, if it's a message or a technique or an approach, if you could each just share one thing that you've really seen be effective um, in your work for change. Honestly, doing talks has been really <laughs> effective for change and doing demonstrations. Um, and uh, I think sometimes people don't realize like how much color is all around us all the time. And so being able to see a natural object um, and then create a dye from it and then extract the color from it, it's really magical <laughs> to witness that. I think uh, just, I think that's been really effective is the visual aspect um, of it. And it makes people really curious to go outside and experiment and um, rub their hands on black walnut and see what happens. And um, I, think, I think for me, for my work, um, that's been the most effective thing is actually speaking and doing demonstrations and offering workshops and things like that. Yeah, and for me, it was really, honestly, getting arrested. <laughs> Um, I went to Climate Week in New York City a, a few weeks ago, and um, there, there was a big march, and I was marching along, and then there was like kind of a big gathering at the end of the march, and I like, I often think that my work doesn't reach people, and like it just goes out into a vacuum, and I don't know what happens to it, and it feels kind of frustrating, and like I'm screaming into a void, but dozens and dozens and dozens of people, maybe even like 100 people, came up to me and they said they were doing civil disobedience and getting arrested because of me and their faces were glowing and smiling and um, I was just blown away because that's why I did it, was to you know, kind of help build the movement and it seemed like it was work. I get emails all the time. Sometimes I get emails about my book but it's usually more about like I guess the civil disobedience and um, you know, I theory of change is a hard thing. Like it's hard to know what's really gonna change society and after 18 years of climate activism, it's just super frustrating. Um, I thought we'd be, I didn't think we'd be fighting the fossil fuel industry the way we are still and losing frankly kind of so badly. I thought we'd, you know, I didn't think that presidents would still be expanding fossil fuel at this point um, but yeah, I can't remember where, why I said, where I was going with that thought, but, um, you know, theories of change, right? So I still think that there's uh, sort of a collective emotional block where it's unpleasant to experience the climate emotions, uh, if, I, if I can call them that. The, the sort of anxiety, the bad feelings that you get when you feel like the planet isn't okay, right? Because you have so much stuff to fucking worry about in your life. It's hard enough to like imagine that the planet is getting worse every year and could take us, like could take down civilization. It's like too much, right? <laughs> you gotta like fucking like, you go to your medical appointments and pay the rent and deal with your kids, you know, failing some class or whatever. And it's like, it's too much to think about the planet. And so it's easy to like, even if you're super well-meaning, you believe the science, you just, it's, it's easier to like, to just think of this narrative of, I don't know, maybe false hope or maybe like the Inflation Reduction Act's enough or maybe someone else is gonna do stuff or maybe, you know. I don't know, I think we all have to step up and be the adults because there aren't enough people doing that. Um, so, again, I kind of lost my train of thought, but, um, but yeah, I think the civil disobedience is important because it cuts through that sort of emotional barrier. People can't really look away from it, and then maybe they start to 
process those emotions because I think that's, I think that's what it's going to take is for all of us individually and then collectively to accept that the situation is totally fucked up and we have to stand up to these corporate billionaires and their, you know, their disinformation and their lies because um, they're, they're deeply broken um, and they're not the adults and the adults among us have to step up and be like, you guys are toddlers, you're hurting yourself, you're hurting others, you're hurting other species, you're hurting our future, and we have to, we, we've got to take the baubles away from you because you're, you're not responsible enough and wise enough to have them. So yeah, I don't know exactly how that change happens, but we have to, take, we have to change like, who we give power to in this society. Um. Is there any, we're just about at time and I don't want to go over, is there a final pressing question or comment? Otherwise I'm gonna, do you want to? Okay. Are you sure they kept sort of do a quick like lightning round? <laughs> lightning round? <laughs> <laughs> we can definitely do a lightning round if people want to, you mean like people ask and answer really quick. Yeah, they try to answer quick. I would love to hear both of you comment on a proposition that I've been sharing for 20 years or so, and that is that because we have no idea what the future is going to be, not just in climate, but in all aspects of our life with technology, we have no idea what the future is going to be. My proposition has been the thing that we can do, yes, appreciate deep time, but the thing we can do is become our most creative and our most entrepreneurial selves so that whatever we find, when we're forming those new ways of living together that you referenced in early in your talk, whatever we find, we will be better prepared to create advantage from whatever we find there if we are more creative, more entrepreneurial, bottoms up, sort of populist creative energy. Does that resonate with either of you as you look at what we should be thinking about for the future? Um, I was thinking about that question while you were just sharing the last answer, actually. Um, I think, you know, it's not, you know, a lot of time, I, I'm an expressive arts therapist mostly with preschool to teens. Um, and a lot of the work that comes up in our sessions is making sure what we're feeling on the inside matches what we're feeling on the outside, feeling empowered, advocating for ourselves, and that we deserve, you know, to be treated with fairness and et cetera, et cetera. And I feel like, for me, for me personally, I feel like my work as a child therapist is really hoping that I'm empowering my clients to um, ask for better and to advocate for better. And I hope that that energy will follow them through to be able to, you know, do the work that you're doing. <laughs> yeah, I'd say really the lightning round answer, say no to bullshit jobs and uh, <laughs> seek after work that makes something real and that helps the people around you. Mm. Good. Anybody else for lightning round? Let's see. Um, I noticed that both of your talks sort of address slowness in different ways, um, kind of thinking about types of slowness, slowing things down. Something that I notice about slowness is sometimes it's not very visible when things are going very quickly around slow things. So how do you make slowness more visible? Oh my God, I mean like capitalism's all about like making us feel like we don't have any time and um, that things have to go so fast and we have to get on planes. I fight that power of that, that, that ca capitalist thing. Like we gotta start like, I don't know, forget about, I don't know, we gotta start playing our own guitars more and having people over to our houses more and um, just like sitting and writing in our journals in the morning outside amongst the leaves. Uh, I don't know, maybe like ending, like I think if we end commercial aviation, honestly, we'll be happier because it's all about like getting someplace super fast and these norms of like forcing us to kind of fling our bodies around the planet really fast. Um, I'd say <laughs> that just like as we started our time together today, just being in community, um, just really making space for that, I think, is really important um, for just, 
like kind of addressing <laughs> that feeling of uh, isolation. I'm not sure if this is answering your question exactly, but um, I think once we like start having those conversations more and connecting with our neighbors more, uh, that I feel like hopefully more change will come about. Um, but I think it's really not working in isolation and working in community um, will maybe propel things faster, <laughs> than, you know? Going slower, sometimes going slower, slower. is faster. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> One of, um, I don't know if people in here know the work of Bayo Akamalafe, but he's a Nigerian teacher writer that I, I admire a lot. But one of his like famous sort of quotable quotes that he uses a lot um, in his talks is, times are urgent, we have to slow down. When we were doing an action at the Mountain Valley Pipeline, we had a saying, which is, uh, I think if I'm, I hope I'm not murdering this, but s slow is smooth and smooth is fast. Mm, love that, <laughs> love that. I think, I think that's a good note to end on. Um, thank you all so much for being here. I'm super grateful. Also, this is closing out our first year of programming for 2023, so thank you all for being part of that. Um, we're looking forward to new adventures next year, um, and we will recommence in February, so um, keep your eye out for that. Um, would love to hear people's feedback and comments and questions and suggestions in the meanwhile. Um, hope that you'll be in touch. And um, stick around for a few minutes if you can and connect with each other. We sort of did our Q&A into the end of the event. Usually we leave some a little time at the end for you just to mingle. But stick around and mingle for a minute if you can. Um, Natalia has some work over on the table over here. So also go take a look at that and explore the beautiful things that, um, that she brought. Um, and yes, go forth and, and uh, slowness and smoothness and quickness. Ha, 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 ha.